indication of how important this subject is. Um, the the community came out nearly a month ago and and said we we feel like there needs to be a town hall where information is said by all the players and all the stakeholders so we can hear a, a consistent message. And immediately the city council said yes. We're going to do that, and this got scheduled within uh, days after that request was made on March 19th. And so um, what what will you have this evening, the way tonight's um, program is going to occur, the town hall, we have a panelist from the city's team as well as uh, some of the other stakeholders that are going to speak, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. We've got a slideshow of approximately 80 slides. And so it, we are anticipating a three hour town hall here. Just that's what we're gauging. I understand we're gonna try to be as quick as possible, but we wanna include time for questions as well. Um, to, to keep the order of the meeting moving along, we're asking you, and when you sat down at your chair, there are comment cards at your chair. We're asking you to write your question on that card and then hand it over to the clerk's office. What we'll do at the end of the presentations, we'll, we'll categorize all the questions and then we'll ask the questions. If we can't get to all the questions, because I can tell from everyone, the audience that you're getting antsy, what we plan on doing is creating a matrix that has all the questions listed and a response to it. And we'll post it on the city's website. So if your question isn't answered, you will see some sort of written response and we'll put that on the city's website along with the uh, presentation. So there are refreshments outside. If, if, you, if you start to get hot, there's water, um, there's, there's food outside. Um, if you haven't been here before or you, haven't, you don't know where the restrooms are, the restrooms are outside the doors um, in the corridor over there. And you have to walk over to the other wing of the building and they're past the office. There, there's a men's room and there's a first women's room and then a men's room. So um, out that way, you can just walk up and, and leave in, during the... The town hall here. Um, I went over the presentation. I went over the questions. For those uh, that are participating via Zoom, the questions, um, if you have questions, you can go into the Q&A um, on the Zoom link and put in your question. We're going to write down your question and it'll be part of the, the public record. So what I'd like to do is is have uh, our our team of panelists here introduce themselves. We'll start with, I'll take the mic out and we'll We'll take it. We'll start with the mayor. Good evening, everyone. John Frenchank, mayor. Dave Bradley, uh, city councilman. I see a lot of public works director. I'm Mike Pitts with Cotton Shires and Associates. I'm your city geologist. I'm having my last inch design with you. I'm Gordon Leon. I'm the director of Backlab. Ken Atridge, president of the uh, East Valley Community Association Board of Directors. Yes, the best. Steve Cummins, I'm uh, with the uh, chairman of the Cape Lab and also civil engineers. Angie Gilbert, from the New Water Service. Selena Luna, government relations manager for Southern California Edison. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Seiberger, I'm a public affairs manager with SoCal Gas. Good evening, I'm not a panelist, but I'm uh, Jennifer Lamarque, I'm Supervisor Dan Khan, Field Deputy for the Food Club. Kayla Garcia, Production Specialist, Southern California Edison. James Edwards. James Edwards is a partner at Philadelphia. And we also have um, on virtual screen on Zoom, we have representatives from Cal OES, from FEMA, as well as um, LA County Office of Emergency Management. And last, I want to introduce myself in case you don't know who I am. My name is Ara Maranian. I'm your city manager. And on that note, we'll get to the next slide. I'm going to hand pass the mayor to come up. Uh, thank you, Ara. <laughs> So thank you all for coming out tonight. Obviously, this is a hugely important meeting for all of us. And welcome to the new Ladero Linda Community Center. We gather here tonight for a town hall that's, of course, of paramount importance to all of us and to address the pressing issue that we all know is the Portuguese Bend landslide complex. 
As an engineer, I've come to appreciate the value of learning from the past, comprehending our present circumstances, and utilizing the latest codes and engineering techniques to pave the way for a safer and more secure future, and you'll hear from our technical people. It's with this mindset that we convene tonight to develop effective strategies and implementable plans. It's crucial to recognize that the KCLAD and ACLAD are not just legal entities. They hold real authority and responsibility akin to our city. Together, we stand committed to seeking tangible solutions for the challenges ahead. For myself, since 2017, my involvement in this matter has been constant. From my time when running for city council to the extensive hearings on the Portuguese Bend back in 2017, I've witnessed these complexities firsthand. Rancho Palos Verdes has taken the lead in addressing these issues, and tonight we'll glean valuable insights from a team of experts reflecting on the lessons learned. Our city's primary concerns remain centered on the safety of our residents, the protection of their property, and the integrity of our public infrastructure. These are complex issues, which is why your presence here tonight is so greatly appreciated. Let us engage in a constructive dialogue, listening to one another with respect and understanding as we collectively work towards solutions that benefit all of us. Thank you for being here. And I'm gonna introduce my colleague on the city council, council member David Rowley. Thank you, Mayor Krushenk. Um, I'm with Councilman David Bradley. Um, uh, the mayor and I both serve on the subcommittee for the land flow and the landslide. Uh, so that's why we are the ones that are speaking tonight. We do have two out of uh, our three other colleagues here in the audience. Um, so we are all very committed to finding real solutions to the real problems. Um, as we all know, the integrated ancient land, uh, Portuguese landslide uh, complex is one of the... Uh -oh. Oh, I thought I was in trouble. No, no, no. <laughs> when the lawyer, when the city attorney starts walking towards you, you kind of wonder. <laughs> and I just started talking. I haven't screwed up yet. Um, but the landslide is one of the existential uh, threats to the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. Having the most continuous land flow in North America is a distinction that we didn't ask for and we certainly don't want. I'm too an engineer by training and I understand complex issues and how to attack multifaceted projects. This one truly has many parts, a technical part, a political part, an environmental part, and a financial part. I think we have finally turned the uh, corner on getting all levels of government, federal, state, including the state chartered uh, geologic hazard abasement districts, county, city, on board and moving in the right direction towards real support to mitigate the continual land flow in Portuguese Bend. Tonight, we all come together to review where we are, where we need to be, and potential paths to get there. At the end of the day, we need to prevent water from recharging the water table, lubricating the slip plane, and remove the artesian water that exists within the complex. To do, do this, we have to fill the fissures to prevent direct recharging of the water table, install non-permeable membranes in the swales and catch basins to prevent water from seeping into the water table, and three, install hydro augers and additional dewatering wells to remove the water that has gotten into the slip plane. Taken together, those mitigation measures should produce real results that dramatically reduce the movement throughout the complex. As the mayor noted, the city is with you and continues to push forward to get real mitigation solutions analyzed, planned for, funded, and implemented. We're here to be a partner with the geologic hazard abasement districts and the rest of the stakeholders the homeowners associations, and the residents of Portuguese Bend and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. Thank you all for coming together tonight and hopefully we have some great dialogue this evening. Thank you. So what, we, what we're gonna do here is because this town hall is to convey information to you, we thought it's very important to first start tonight's uh, town hall with some background on the Portuguese Bend landslide complex and the ancient landslide complex. So what I'd like to do is now introduce our city geologist, Mike Phipps with Cotton Shires and Associates. He's got a lot of experience with this specific landslide and other landslides in Southern California, including Malibu. I'll let him give a little bio on himself and then we'll get into your presentation. 
quicker it is working out. Okay. Thank you, Ara. Um, my name is Mike Phipps. I'm a principal engineering geologist with Cotton Shires and Associates uh, based in California up in the Bay Area. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on me, uh, went to USC, graduated with a degree in geology, uh, went to work for Dr. James Slauson, who was uh, one of the members of the uh, original ACLAD technical panel. Um, after that, I went to work for Dr. Bing Yin, who uh, worked with Kerry Elig on the first uh, uh, big report I ever saw about trying to mitigate the Portuguese Bend landslide. And then I went to work for Cotton Shires and Associates, who I'm with now for the last 15 years. Um, and Bill Cotton and Pat Shires have been involved in uh, review of uh, previous efforts to stabilize Portuguese Bend and and uh, Abalone Cove. Um, so I've got a I've got a really good background working with Dr. Slauson. I cut my teeth down here uh, in the in the mid '80s, uh, drilling borings and and learning about the rocks that are uh, affecting this area of, of the peninsula. Um, so I've been asked to give you just a little bit of the uh, history of of uh, why we're here today with dealing with this landslide. Um, I'm kind of the uh, the big picture guy in giving the holistic view of what's happening on this landslide and advising the city uh, kind of from, from that level. Um, are we going to do this part of my presentation now or later? Which slide did you want to? Uh, the, the one that had the, uh, it was in your presentation, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You still slide so, again. Somebody told me we were going to cover this later. Okay. Swing back then. Sorry. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so many of you probably already know this, but um, uh, back in uh, in the in the mid '40s, the U.S. Geological Survey um, produced a big report on the geology of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, and they identified a big area um, somewhat inside the yellow line that you see up there on that map. Um, as a uh, ancient landslide area. Um, this area has been studied ever since then. Uh, the, the land is literally like a piece of Swiss cheese at this point because it's had so many borings drilled in it and so many studies done, uh, hundreds of studies. Um, other people have, have mapped this a little bit differently. The California Geological Survey in 2007 um, issued a landslide inventory map that uh, shows it a little bit bigger and extending um, above the ridge where Island View and some of these other properties are. Um, and the Valley View uh, Graben area is considered part of the, the prehistoric landslide. This landslide started moving um, hundreds of thousands of years ago. The peninsula has been uplifting uh, about 26 uh, 0.26 millimeters a year or 26 millimeters a year. I'm, I may be off by a factor of 100. Anyhow, the peninsula has been uplifting, sea level has been going up and down, but over hundreds of thousands of years, there's been, I mean, at one point, uh, the peninsula was an island and not even part of the mainland. Um, but once it emerged, it's had all this wave action hitting it on the south side um, for, for eons. And we've got these weak rocks and we have uh, the rocks dip towards the coast, and there are some beds in particular within this formation that are um, extremely weak uh, bentonitic clay beds that come from volcanic ash that was laid down millions of years ago um, that create this big issue with landsliding. Um, so as time went on and, and development started occurring in this area, um, at one point, um, Crenshaw Boulevard was going to be extended uh, over the crest of the hill and down to uh, PG Drive South, and um, big landslide started moving. That was the beginning of Portuguese Sand Landslide in 1956, and then it grew larger in the in the years thereafter. Um, and it's been moving ever since. Portions of Portuguese Bend have moved hundreds and hundreds of feet. Um, some of you may have houses 
that have moved some of those distances. I know there are some properties that are, are definitely, uh, the homes are no longer on the property they originally built on. Um, so Portuguese Bend in 56, Abalone Cove landslide started moving early signs in 1974, but really got going from 78 to 83 when we had a very wet cycle and several consecutive wet years. Um, up above in Rolling Hills, you have the Flying Triangle, uh, landslide that comes right down to uh, it comes a little bit into RPV. Um, that started moving a piece of it started moving in 1978, and then it really started moving from 80 to 83. Um, and then uh, we've got the Klondike Canyon landslide, which is over on the east edge, and it started moving around 1979, 80. Uh, somewhat, you know, stopped moving for quite a long time. And it, my understanding is it is, you know, historically it's only moved in the, in the real wettest years that we've had, maybe uh, 97, 98. And um, I know that it started moving again in 2005, it's kind of in exactly the same place that it's, you know, moving today. So um, that's an overview. Uh, those landslides that I just mentioned are highlighted on that, uh, on that picture up there. Uh, kind of the magenta color. And, you know, what I've been charged with doing is trying to map in the area that is that is now moving today. Um, those are, I mean, taking out Flying Triangle, because it's not in the city, um, all of those landslides, the ACL, the PBL, and the KCL, that we like to call them, <coughs> covered about 380 acres. Um, but the area that's moving now is a much larger area within the ancient portion of the landslide, and there's now 675 acres of land moving. That's over a square mile. So this is a monster of a landslide that we're dealing with, um, and it's moving at a really good clip. So um, I think that's what you wanted me to cover at this point, and then uh, come back. Thanks, Mike. We'll, we'll have Mike come back up. And so it, it's important in understanding the context of, of um, this historical landslide, it being thousands of years old, but in 1956, it was triggered. And within the, the yellow boundary line, the center area, which is the Portuguese bend, that's what was activated in 1956. And as Mike indicated, uh, years later is when, when Abalone Cove landslide and Portuguese bend landslide, I just turned it off. Um, I, I'm sorry, Klondike Canyon were activated. And there, so keep in mind within that yellow ancient landslide complex, there are five subslides. It's the Abalone Cove to the west. You've got Portuguese Bend in the center. You've got Klondike Canyon um, to the left or to the east. Above it is Flying Triangle and Rolling Hills. And then within the Klondike Canyon is also the beach landslide. So those are the five subslides that you may hear about tonight that make up the ancient landslide complex. So Next slide, please. The, the reason why I wanted to bring that up is um, in, in as Mike indicated, the, there was a rate of the rate of movement started to pick up in the in the seventies, in the late seventies, and the residents in the Abalone Cove area um, were were starting to try to find a way to address. The, the the land movement. And simply put, and Michael explained it, and same with Nevin, our, our geotechnical engineer, it's water. Water is contributing to the movement and is what's causing um, the land to pick up in speed. And so in, in the late 70s, the residents in privately in Abalone Cove said, we're gonna, we're gonna start putting in some dewatering wells to help extract water that's in, in the ground. And so what when when the residents, these residents start to pay for these dewatering wells at the same time. And, and this evening, if you didn't see uh, our, our one of our founders of our city, Ken Dida, who's here up in the front row, uh, Ken Dida was on the city council at the time, and this was right around 1978. And what the city council wanted to do at that time was to, to help the residents find a way to pay for these, um, these dewatering wells. But there was really no path forward on how to do that. And so what what council, uh, what former mayor uh, Ken Dida did is he connected with our senator at the time, Senator uh, Beverly, 
And they wrote legislation to form what's called a geologic hazard abatement district. And I'm not sure, Anisha, are you able to move? <laughs> So in, in the late 70s, around 1979, the state legislator uh, enacted what's called a geologic hazard abatement district. They, uh, they formed, they, they set the legislation that allows these, these GADs to form in the state of California. And in 1980, the first um, GAD that was formed was the Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District. The second GAD that was formed in California was the Klondike Canyon Abatement District. These are the first two of these geologic hazard abatement districts that were formed in the state of California. It's very important that you understand why they were formed and what their purpose is. And there's a document called a plan of control. And that plan of control is required for all of these GADs because it basically says what the, what the charter is for the landslide abatement district. Simply put, there are two there are two um, objectives of forming these geologic hazard abatement districts. The first is to extract water from the ground, and the second is to deal with surface water so it doesn't penetrate into the ground and recharge the groundwater table. That is called out in the plan of control that was um, part of the adoption in, in 1980 when the city council formed or authorized the formation of the Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District. That document is a public document. It's available. I've shared it. We've we spent years looking for that document and we finally found the document. What's very interesting is when you see that document, it was it was prepared by the geologists at the time. Many of you have heard Perry Elig's name. Perry Elig works for Robert Stone and Associates and he prepared that the GEO report. And in that geology report that was presented to the council in January of 1980, it called out the, what the plan of control is and who benefits from that plan of control. And, and what happens with that plan of control and why it was important to identify who benefits is because the funding that comes with that plan of control comes from the property owners within those district boundary lines. So, so this uh, landslide abatement district is essentially no different than a library district, a school district, any other special district that you pay into, you're assessed a levy, and that, that money that you pay into every year um, goes towards these mitigation measures that are called out in the plan of control. That was proposed in January 1980, and it says draft on it. It was reintroduced in August of 1980 with edits. Back at the time, they used whiteout and they struck out language. There's no, there was no reformatting and and what we what technology allows us to do. But they took the original draft and they made the changes to it, and that's ended up being the final draft. And so I think what we shared with the district is that we the city considers that the final draft. So I wanted to just highlight those two things because as we talk about. Um, we continue tonight's presentation. You're going to hear from those districts and hear what they're doing and, and how they're funding some of their efforts. So I'm going to now hand it over to who's the next speaker. I, we don't have our slide deck working. Can we get your slide deck? Yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> We'll get the slide deck working because there's some important information. Where are people? The text run tape, too. Where are people? You're in Florida Batteries. Mike, Mike is going to come back and explain what he's talking about. We're going to try to open up his PowerPoint. How many megabytes of yours? Yeah. Hundreds. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm gonna. I just want to talk specifically about a, a couple of things that that uh, I've been looking at and and that we've been looking at uh, at the group. Um, you know, the first is is rainfall. Um, you know, rainfall is our friend. We need the water, but in the case of landslides, it is our absolute nemesis. 
And it's it's the single probably most important thing uh, that's happening out here that we don't have a lot of control over in terms of how much falls. Um, but what we can try to control is pulling water out of the ground or preventing it from getting into the ground. Um, and that's kind of what the theme uh, is here in terms of emergency measures and and you know long-term mitigation. Um, so we look at uh, two rain gauges uh, in this area. One is on Point Vicente, one is um, up at the Rolling Hills Fire Station on the other side of the hill. And um, and they're uh, they're dramatically different in terms of quantity, but um, Rolling Hills is, uh, I believe, is more representative of the the watersheds that uh, feed into the landslide area. So uh, that's the one that I've been using. It has a 67 year record and you know, the mean annual rainfall, there's like 13.7 inches. Um, so uh, just to give you some statistics in, in the 22, 23 season, when the landslide really took off and started moving, uh, it accelerated big time. Um, you know, we were at a, a 26.3 inches. So 192% of historical average. Um, and this year we're at 22 and a half inches. Um, Hopefully we're just about done with all the rain this year. 164% um, of average. So back-to-back -back wet years uh, has has been very problematic for uh, the conditions in the landslide. Um, what that is doing is infiltrating in and uh, raising the groundwater levels within the landslide and probably increasing the um, the piezometric surface of the of confined water that's believed to be below the landslide, the artesian water. Um, so leading up to this point, um, there wasn't really a lot of landslide movement going on uh, where it is today. Um, back in the in the mid um, 2010 and beyond, um, we had a five year drought with below average rainfall from 2011 to 2016, and then a couple of wet years. Two out of three years were wet, and all of a sudden, what I started seeing. It's about when I started looking at some of the GPS data and seeing a little uptick in in movement, and but I'd seen that happen in other really wet years, so I wasn't really sure what was going on. I thought maybe this is just another uptick, but this time it stayed level, and then it took off when the big rains came, uh, starting in uh, 22, 23. Um, so what we're dealing with now is sort of this cumulative, you know, five of the last eight years have been wetter than average. Um, the only bright thing in the in the horizon is that La Nina conditions are forecast for the Pacific Ocean. And historically, there's a statistical chance that things will be drier than normal uh, for the next year. So let's hope that that happens. Um, next slide. In advance. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. Oh, the much awaited graph. Um, this, this is a histogram showing rainfall at that gauge, uh, rolling hills going all the way back to 1957, I think. And as you can see, uh, this Mediterranean climate that we live in, things really bounce around. Um, the 13.7 year average is shown in that 
Doyle's dash line across the middle. And, and there's a, always a big variation uh, around the mean um, in, in our climate here. Um, so you can see some of those higher years and, and lower years. And obviously at the right hand side of the chart, uh, uh, we've got uh, four above normal years. Um, and then this year would be tapped onto that uh, once we finish it. So uh, one of the other things we look at is um, precipitation surplus or deficit. And that's sort of looking at the deviation from how much rain normally falls and and looking at that collectively over time it's sort of a it's a it's a broad way of looking at, at a water budget and what what might be getting into the landside area versus what's not getting into the land, landside area in a drier year or in a series of drier years so um that water budget line is the red line and, and back in uh uh in the mid 70s so we were at quite a deficit and then uh, had a very wet cycle. And lo and behold, this is when uh, Abalone Cove started moving. This is when Klondike Canyon started moving. And I'm sure that Portuguese Bend uh, started moving faster and Flying Tiger started moving. So, uh, uh, but what's really interesting is that the, the, the surplus that we had going into the early 2000s was very high. Um, but but I think a lot of that was largely being controlled by by dewatering efforts, um, and you know then we went back into a drought from 2011 forward, and that surplus came back down and is almost back down to a deficit level now. But two years in a row we're picking back up uh, with above normal rain. Next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about land movement. Obviously, the, the, the obvious statement is the land movement is continuing. Um, you're all seeing that. You're seeing it every day when you drive down TV Drive South, or you're seeing it in your neighborhoods if, if you live in the landslide. Um, you know, the, the movement continues. The surveyor, uh, Michael McGee, is actually out surveying this week to get a new set of data points. Um, right now, we're trying to survey it about every six weeks. And so we're gonna we're gonna have a, a new set of data, you know, actually early next week, which I'm really looking forward to to understand. Okay, is this thing still accelerating or is it is it slowing down? Um, in October of 2023 uh, was really when the stunning stunning realization happened that that uh, uh, the ground movement accelerated three to five times over what, how it moved uh, compared to a year earlier in October of 22. So. Um, that that was a that was a big deal, and that movement started to show up in terms of lots of ground fissures and cracking, and um, you know, in bits and pieces. It wasn't everywhere. Um, it didn't fail catastrophically. It's been a slow, sort of creeping, developing thing. But that kind of acceleration over one year is significant. Um, then we went and read GPS uh, monuments three months later, and it had accelerated another four or five times over the previous rate from the previous year. So that was very significant. And then we read it two months later, another acceleration. So we're just on this acceleration path right now. That's why I'm so interested in um, what the next data set is going to look like. Um, all of this movement has resulted in the expansion of the original landslide areas, the historic areas from 380 to about 675 acres. Um, another thing that we're looking at is what we're adding some new points and we're also looking at some points that are way up at the top because I think there's a risk that this thing could get bigger than it than it already is. Um, and so far, the, the, the highest points that we have um, do not look like they're 
they're moving significantly. They're they're right on the edge of, of sort of the error range of the survey. So I don't think I don't think they're moving, but uh, we're we're going to watch that carefully going into the future. Uh, next slide. That's <laughs> way. Uh, okay, so uh, this is our our uh, this hill shape map that's in the, the gray map underneath. We made from uh, uh, lidar data from 2015 uh, that was available, and it gives a nice 3D image of kind of what this area looks like. And the those city boundaries are on there. The yellow boundary is showing the ancient slide area. The, the pink boundaries are the historically known landslides. And all of these little arrow things uh, are the GPS uh, survey monuments. Um, if they've got three arrows, then that represents uh, October 22 to October 23, and then October 23 to January 24, and then January 24 to March 24. If there's only two arrows, then the certain reading wasn't taken on those points. Um, but you can see that the, these are scaled as well. So uh, if you were looking at this at, at scale, uh, uh, you know, I think it's one inch, two and a half feet or something like that. Mm -hmm. You're really not going to be able to get that on the screen. Um, everything's moving in a pretty consistent direction. Uh, we learn a lot from, from looking at, at these data. Um, things are moving more at the coast um, than they do in the back area. Uh, because the landslide is broken up into several discrete blocks. Um, I'm sure Nevin will be talking about the discrete blocks and the complexity of this landslide a little bit more. Um, but, but typically what we see is, is much greater movement at the toe and lesser movement in the middle and, and the lowest amount of movement at the top. But at the top, uh, these points that are up above uh, Narcissa Drive and going up into the reserves. Um, some of those areas have now moved, you know, five to seven feet since last, last October. Um, there are, some of you probably own homes in those areas. And so uh, it is, it's very concerning in terms of how much it's moving. Um, we've drawn the green dash line around uh, uh, the area of active movement. All of those red marks that you see on there are sort of a dumbed down version of, of what I've been uh, mapping in the field and trying to connect the dots um, but it's pretty obvious that this entire area that's uh, marking green is actually moving. Um, you know, so this has resulted in uh, a lot of deteriorating conditions. Um, obviously, the roadways, the, the trails within the reserves, uh, Wayfarers Chapel, unfortunately, the, the uh, administration building there had to be red tagged the other day because of its poor condition. Um, and, and all of your private properties you know, we don't know entirely what's going on on everybody's private property unless you let us come on and have a look. Um, so, um, you know, uh, the roadways in particular are uh, one of the city's big concerns. And, you know, they've been employing all their resources possible to keep those roads safe and, and patch the cracks. I think they're doing a great job of that, um, you know, within their areas of their responsibility. Um, next slide. So just another way of looking at some of these movement data, this is a uh, time displacement graph. Uh, so on the bottom axis, it's uh, October 2007 on the far left and June of 2024 on the far right. And we're really looking at the displacement over time. Um, so what you're seeing all, all the way across from, from about 2007 until 2018 is not very much movement down in the order of uh, uh, a couple of tenths of a, of a foot at the most. Uh, and these are for points that are up in the in the upper ancient landslide area, uh, up around Upper Narcissa Drive up there. Um, and then you can see the little uptick that we noticed in 2018. And uh, what was weird about that was that uh, it didn't tick back down after we had two consecutive dry years. There were two years that were below normal in like 21 and 22. Um, so the landslide actually started moving and it took off. And then the rains hit and it really took off. And so that all those curves have just gone uh, exponential. Uh, this is also plotted against uh, 12 months uh, 
uh, antecedent rainfall. So we looked at how much rain fell in the 12 months before these readings were taken as uh, to see if there's a correlation there. And to me, it, it seems like there is. Uh, every time you have a very wet year, uh, you get an uptick in the movement. Um, next slide. Um, these are some of the points that are up at the very top. And, and this is just to give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of the, uh, the uppermost points. Um, most of these are up on, on, on Burma Road or the former Crenshaw Boulevard. They're the CR points. And uh, the two that are uh, the two that are showing a lot of movement, where there's two big inflection points over time, um, those are in the landslide down on Burma Road, um, up, up near the top of what's actively moving. And then all these lines down low um, are the points up above that we're watching closely to see uh, if those develop further. I mean, there's a little tiny uptick at the, at the very end, but uh, I'm not sure because it's very close to the error range of uh, the, the equipment. Um, so that's just something we're keeping an eye on. Because if this thing is getting bigger, we definitely want to know that. Next slide. Can you tell us what the axes are, the vertical we can't yeah. read? Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. It's, uh, this would be better at 11 by 17 in front of you. Um, the vertical axis on the left is um, incremental displacement in feet. And so each tick mark is um, up the side, or that's half a foot uh, on this one. And then across the bottom is, is dates. It keeps going December, June, December, June from 2008 all the way up to 2024. And then there's a third axis on the right hand side, which is uh, the rainfall, the 12 month AMC rainfall. So those are the blue uh, vertical columns that you see on the graph. Um, this, this one uh, we, we presented just to show what's going on in the area of PD Drive South, uh, the area known as the Sea Jump. Um, there, there are, uh, what a horrible name. Uh, so, uh, the, some of these points are to show what's going on in the Portuguese fan slide, and um, you know, the reason why that area is deforming so quickly. Um, the, the red and the blue lines are points in the, uh, right next to the sea jump area that are just taken off, and so that that is probably the most problematic area of PD Drive South. Um, I think, I don't know if I have any more slides. That, is that it? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think some of these have probably been published. Uh, they might have been in the staff report for the last council meeting. That's all I have for now. I look forward to um, answering any questions you guys have. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I think we had solved the glitch with the PowerPoint presentation. We're going to switch over to the previous presentation, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ramsey Awad, who's going to talk about some of the projects. Just a couple points that I want to highlight in the what Mike Phipps just went over. When you look at that map, and that map that shows you the yellow boundary line of the ancient landside complex, and then you look at the five uh, magenta purple lines, which are the the recently documented areas that have been moving. And then you look at the green line um, that has been mapped over the last couple of years. Essentially what you're seeing is how large and how much it's grown in just a matter of two years since 2023. So it's a very, very telling map. Um, and and it, it almost is moving in the direction to overlap where the ancient landslide complex boundary limits are. So I'm going to, before I hand it over, I, I wanted to show this in my presentation where we couldn't have the PowerPoint shown. This map right here identifies the boundary limits, the geographically area that covers both of those landslide abatement districts. And you can see AGCLAD is, is, a, is much larger and encompasses pretty much the entire western portion. So properties within the area uh, identified as ADCLAD, they're part of that property assessment district. And then KCLAD is over to um, the, the east there, and that's in the Seaview neighborhood and down into Portuguese Bend as well. And then I also want to point out that the red line on this map 
is the boundary limits of what was once known as the redevelopment agency. Many of you may remember the RDA. The RDA was, was uh, set up by the state and passed down to the county and that RDA, we were the city and the districts were getting funding through the RDA. But when, when that sunsetted, um, the, the city had to take on the responsibilities for certain areas of the RDA and then um, the districts were responsible for their areas as well. So that was that was a significant milestone in terms of a change in, in um, the authority powers. And by the way, the two districts, they are they are public agencies. They are considered um, and typical to any other district. They have elections. They are subject to the election code. They are subject to um, all, all the state government, uh, the government code as well. So they have to follow those rules, and they are and they have access to funding sources that um, the city is as well. And we'll talk about that later in the program. So I'm going to hand it over to the public works director Ramsey Wad who's gonna to talk to you about what the city has been working on to address what we have been documenting over the last uh, several years, not just the last two years. Again, my name is Ramsey Awad, Public Works Director for the city. Uh, so I'll talk about the work or the proposed work in the Portuguese Bend landslide, not the Klondike Canyon or the uh, Abalone Cove landslide. And this dates back years, back to 2016, when the city council started the process for remediating the land movement in the Portuguese Bend landslide. Through a public process and uh, many studies, the city council uh, accepted a uh, preliminary design for a project to remediate that landslide. And the project consisted of three basic components. Number one, and this is in no particular order, this is certainly not an order of importance. Number one, fissure filling. Filling the fissures so that water does, surface water does not enter. Two, surface drainage improvements. And that means constructing surface drainage swales uh, to take the canyons, Portuguese, paintbrush, and shibashi, and uh, continue them, convey the water, and you see it in the green lines on the screen there, uh, to convey that water down to PV Drive South for the flow reduction area to control the flow through a culvert under PV Drive South and pipe it all the way down to the ocean. And the uh, point there is to not allow uh, rainwater to enter into the slide area and contribute to movement. And third is hydrogers. And hydrogers are basically underground drains that extract water. These drains can be very deep, they can be uh, very long as well, 1,200 feet or more. And these hydrogers were planned at strategic locations and, and you can see them here on the screen. Uh, the hydrogers are really arrays. There's a launch point and then up to five drains that are inserted underground from these launch points. So what you see is the webs in red. Uh, at the base of the web is the launch point and then the, uh, the red uh, lines are the underground drains. Next slide, please. As uh, Mike was talking about, conditions changed dramatically, particularly over the past year. And so the city saw the need to act immediately to stabilize the landslide and implement emergency measures. So we worked with our geotechnical engineers to develop emergency remediation measures based on the current conditions or mitigation measures, I should say. And uh, what was recommended to the city is the installation of two emergency hydrogers. And those two hydrogers are same concept, underground drains to extract the water uh, at the two locations shown in yellow there, one and two. Uh, the, 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 these hydrogers will be a significant investment for the city. And so I'll just take a moment to talk about the process of installing these hydrogers. What happens first is that boreholes will be drilled into the ground 150 feet or even deeper. And geotechnical instrumentation is installed in these boreholes so that we can gather information about what's underground, information about the slide, where is it moving, how deep, what angle, what are the underground water conditions. And that is then used to inform the exact design of the hydrogers, the underground drains. The drains are then installed sequentially. The first drain goes in based on data that's gathered. That has instruments on it as well, based on data that's gathered there. Uh, adjustments can be made to the second drain and so on and so forth. The length can change, the exact location can change, et cetera. Uh, and again, because this is such a, a significant investment for the city, these emergency measures as well as the overall project, the city 
uh, hired Khan Shires to peer review these uh, uh, proposed emergency remediation measures. And we're actually going through that peer review process right now. We're working on finalizing the peer review process, uh, and it could result in a change in the exact location of the launch point so that we can optimize it and minimize um, the, the um, uh, uh, adverse conditions that we may encounter. Finally, as part of the mitigate the emergency mitigation measures, the city also is planning to make uh, significant improvements on PV Drive South at the ski jump, or the area locally known as the ski jump, by trying to smooth that out. Many of you probably already know, a couple of weeks ago, we started an interim improvement there uh, to try to smooth it out and keep the road in, uh, in decent condition. Uh, we're going to continue to do that, and we're also working on a more significant regrading of the ski jump so that we can make it more resistant to future movement and route, allow the road to continue to operate smoothly. Next slide, please. So I want to just touch on the funding for these projects. These projects are significant investments for the city, um, and um, the city applied for a grant with FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, for the original project in the amount of $33 million. We were selected for, 20, for a $23 million grant with a $10 million non-federal match required. This grant is only for the Portuguese Bend landslide. It cannot be used on the Abalone Cove or Klondike Canyon landslides, and it can only be used on the measures identified in the project. Um, of course, uh, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, we need to go in with interim measures, the emergency measures, and those are estimated to cost approximately $10 million. This will ultimately be deducted from the uh, BRIC grant and so the revised BRIC grant amount will be 60, approximately $16 million. But there's also another drainage project that the city is undertaking at PV Drive South and Pepper Tree to improve the roadside uh, drainage there, make sure that water doesn't get into the uh, ground again. And so the total investment the city is looking at is $36 million. Uh, and there you see the uh, BRIC grant amount as well as uh, Supervisor Hong pledge for $5 million to contribute towards the remediation efforts. Next slide, please. And finally, um, I'll note that the city council directed assistance to the geologic hazard abatement districts or directed staff to work with the geologic hazard abatement districts to provide assistance, both financial assistance as well as in-kind services. And so the city is now working on a financial assistance package that includes a zero interest loan to the geologic hazard abatement district. And th that loan is based on a plan that is um, signed by a, a certified engineering geologist and also peer reviewed by the city. In addition, the city has and will continue to offer other services such as engineering project management uh, and so on. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Renzi. Um, we're going to switch PowerPoints and we're going to ask our ge um, your geotechnical engineer to give a presentation, but I just want to add some remarks and you're going to find me doing that just to make sure I underscore a couple things. The city started its Portuguese Bend landslide remediation project in 2016. Over the, since the city incorporated in 1973, we inherited this landslide that was moving, um, but the city knew that when we incorporated. And one, one of the, this, the city has worked very aggressively over the last 50 years of its cityhood to find a way to address um, the landslide and the water that's contributing to its movement using different engineering techniques. Many, they, they haven't succeeded other than the dewatering um, solution that, that has been able to extract water. In fact, in the Portuguese Bend area, there, there was a, let me step back, there was a lawsuit that was filed by residents against the city and LA County back in the 80s. Part of that settlement uh, set aside money for certain measures to be taken to help stabilize this landslide. One of the measures was to have the city install dewatering wells in the Portuguese Bend landslide area. And the city did, but they failed because they were sheared off because of the, the movement. So they were not successful. But many people ask, and they've been asking since 2016, when the then city council said, hey, we've got to come up with a program, a project using current engineering techniques to resolve and address um, the movement and the water that's happening in Portuguese Bend. But people were asking, why just Portuguese Bend and not Abalone Cove and not Klondike Canyon? The answer is, the city is responsible for mitigation measures for Portuguese Bend, 
the districts are responsible for those two areas. Uh, that that is important distinction, which is why the city was moving forward. Plus, the the graphs that Mike was showing you, what we were we were noting movement in Portuguese Bend, not the two districts. The districts were 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 doing a good job at stabilizing the land movement. So in 2016, we didn't have that issue. That was not the issue that was being faced. We were seeing land movement in Portuguese Bend, and that is why that project moved forward. And EIR was was um, published last year. We're in the process of finalizing that EIR. The council at its March 19th meeting said, you need to finish that EIR immediately so we can finalize the, 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 the EIR and get it over to FEMA because in order for us to get that $23 million that was we were selected for, we need to finish the environmental review process so that they can do their, their NEPA review and then hopefully expedite their review and get uh, release those money. So I just wanted to add some some uh, comments there regarding the Portuguese Bend Landside Remediation Project. So Devin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I know you've got a lot to go over. This is very interesting because this explains why how the water is contributing to the movement. Well, I had a lot to go over, so how come I have only 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> so we are talking here about not a big landslide, but also a pretty unique landslide, and you have to hear some information on this slide. Uh, just for reference, you know, I read a comment from uh, so we need to speak on the very turned it on. No, I think it's on. Oh, it's on. Okay, how about this? Yeah. Huh. So uh just for reference, you know, and I noticed your comments in well comments in CDC on uh base on uh CQI documents on uh, whatever was published it was. This landslide is about 10 times bigger than the right point landslide in the vicinity that many of you come to. It is four times bigger than the big rock mesa landslide in Malibu. And they call themselves big now. Well, they are big, this is huge. So a big landslide, a huge landslide, you need big ideas to fix it. And you need a team of people, you know. And you need a multi-disciplinary team of people to fix it. This is simply not your typical funding job that, you know, what is coming in, they let it out in the end. It is a complex geology, it's a complex situation, you know, it needs to be uh, dealt with properly. It needs to be modeled, it has to be, you know, properly designed, it needs to be monitored during construction and then, you know, adjustments might need to be made. So what I will do in the next 15 minutes, I will do impossible. I will try to explain what's going on and how we will fix it. Uh, and, you know, to be able to do that, you know, to be able to do what typically takes two to three hours to do properly, you know, I'll try to do it in 15 minutes. But to do that, I will need to teach a little, you know, introduce me two or three engineering concepts of that, you know, but it's educational. And I will give a physical model of what's going on. So I'll also show you that. So can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so here what I'm showing is a conception, conceptual rendering, like a sketch, a cartoon of the landscape. So here's what I'd like you to do, what I will do on this. Let me show it here. See, in the second year of you know, engineering school, this is what we teach you. Then, you know, every landscape has three components. There's a passive zone, this is what's holding it. There's active zone, this is what's causing the trouble. And then you have something in the middle which does nothing. If you want to put the road, this is very difficult. So let me say this, let me say this in a different way. Everybody knows you don't excavate at the top of the landscape. Or if you put a berm or not a road at the top, you also make it worse. So this is a basic principle and does apply also here. Now let me illustrate this a little bit more. You see. If this is holding it, that means heavier this is better, right? If you excavate, it becomes lighter. So let me show you here a concept of friction. 
So this is a model of my favorite things like a scale of one to 200,000, okay? I have a same paper blue that you want. And uh, you know, this is the line side, okay? If I look it here, and I put more row on that, you need to play. It's easy to move. If I put a load on that, you know, make it heavier, it's not that easy to move. You can try, you know, you can come here, push it, and see if you can move it. If I push it again, okay? So, what is the problem? Let me go to the next slide. Because what can make this model of the landscape, the total of the landscape, if you wish to like it, if you are not putting, if you are not excavating, you are not removing anything. Well, what can make it like that is if I push it from the bottom, and I push it from the bottom with the water pressure. <laughs> See my legs like? Yes, of course. Like holding a landslide. <laughs> so, now with those situations, the familiar is holding a landslide. Okay. So, I have a more important here. It's empty because it's for me. Right? So, if somebody does a reading, I'll tell you how you can do it on the bone after this presentation. So if I have water here and I want to dissolve and water flows higher elevation to lower elevation, what will happen? What will happen to my water landscape? It will go up, it will become lighter. It will be like you see here as this boat at the beach, right? This uh, ocean goes up, this is the moon. Now it's standing. Water level goes up, it will move towards the ocean. That is the concept of ancient pressure. This is what we have here. This is what we don't have at our level. This is what we don't have at one point, which was so mitigated with simple, no high water safety demand. This is what we don't have at big rock mesa and nautical, but we have here at ancient pressure. So I'll show you a little bit more. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. My last one just failed. <laughs> okay, there is more. There are concepts, you know, and civil engineers like to use on material science, you know, like, you know, peak and then there's very visual shoes and I think it's more. I will not bore you with this, but I will mention that if you go to the next slide, that we can account for all of this and then look what is causing movement of my favorite points. So, and what I can tell you here, I, mean, I mentioned, I mean, this is a complex problem, it's not just a vision picture. There are at least seven causes of this. One of the causes is the erosion at the top, right? We cannot do anything with it. It's going to get worse as sea levels go up, but we cannot control it, we cannot do anything. We do believe that this adhesion pressure, which is acting here at the top, below this all I just told you is what's holding the whole slide, is the predominant cause. This is what this remediation effort is focused upon. This is the most expensive part of it. But there are other parts, there are the causes which you know we can address and we will do something about it. One is to get rid of this, you now actually to relieve some of the water within the landscape mass. So there is water within the landscape mass, there is water below it. It separates those two water levels, what we call this phase of pages, because it's a something like a liner, something which water cannot go through, which is what you know geologists call a very hydraulically efficient boundary. Which is becoming more and more hydraulically efficient because as things like moves and grinds all this, you know, and pets, you know, and uh, becomes, you know, something very fine grain consolidated water type. So we will try to do that. And we'll do that in an intelligent way because if we pump groundwater here, this is now, for example, government, we will make this all lighter. 
and you can make it worse, which I showed you. With my HPA open slate, if I make this slate, then it's worse. So one needs to understand these engineering principles. We need to design a solution in a very intelligent way, which I believe we did. There are other things that contradict here. Some of you asked about, you know, getting many questions about how the practice is not built and so on. Yes, there are bentonite plates within this kind of uh, Do they cost the travel? Yes, they do. Why they cost the travel? How do we know? Just look, if you look at this displacement vectors that Mike showed you, none of them is moving at the same rate. Each of them moves differently. Why is that? Because this lens of mass is not rigid. It's deformed. It deforms. What messes up is also those mental impacts in it. We then can we do something about it? No, we can't. This is basic matter. Well, I really believe that this efficient pressure of the power is the and calls the length slide. And this is what we are focusing to fix this. But we can also mitigate the other things which I'll show you in the next slide. So let me go a little bit back and say, try to answer some of the questions. Then we tell, okay, this is all fine. But how do you know? Can you check this? Can you verify? And I can. How I can? Because I can model the whole of the on one side in three dimensions. Using the same technology that SpaceX is using to develop this big PFI, I hope you can send 100 people in the audience. It's the same technology, it's a final development method. I can model it, use the model. I can make this model 3 d detail. I can model this thing box. I can model groundwater pressures from below. I can model groundwater inside this landscape. I can even draw back on the beds. And then, that's fine. I can match what's going on with the model. If it doesn't match, I can make changes in material parameters to show you this fancy constitutive model. You know, so I can, you know, what we call calibrate the model, the model to know what's going on. Why is that important? Because then I can design a media of measures which, you know, shows that whatever we are proposing, it has a high, high, uh, high degree of success that, you know, has a, a probability of success and that, you know, can stabilize this. But it's also that important because if we have partial measures right now, these emergency measures, then we can see what will be the effect of those emergency measures. Will we have some impact or how do we see that? So we did all of this. If you go to the next slide. You know, let me, you know, explain you know, how we look at it. Uh, what I call this is a scientific approach. What I mean, it's a scientific approach. So here's our final balance. We know that we need to deal with that vision pressure. We know we need to, you know, do uh, uh, other things. How do you do that? In a principle, in a concept, what you want to do is you want to prevent water coming from high elevations. And you've seen in my model, you know, about high elevations, and you know, water, water is higher than the top. So we know water is coming from high elevations. So you want to intercept it. How do we get conceptual? If I have a magic wand, I would dig a big trench, 150 feet, seal this, and we're done. I can do that. I can do a few other things. We also know that some of the water is coming through the crops, the fishes, through the you know, uh, uh, soils you have uh, within the landscape. So, what can we do about that? We can seal that. How can we seal that? We can fill in the cracks. We can improve the surface water drainage so there's no ponding of water. So, a chance of whatever we miss you know, ends up in the landscape. And then, you know, at the end, we can relieve artesian pressure at the top to the system of hydro, which I'll show you in the next few slides. So that is conceptual. This is the idea. Now, let's see how we will do that in practice on the next slide. And then let's see what modeling is telling us how this will work. So next slide, please. 
So this is what we will do. We will first install one of those, one of the batteries or systems of hydrogen.
Now, I do assure you that technology and the hotel show on its slides is more advanced than Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Okay, so just a snapshot of this, you know, technology, how they work, how they work, you know, what happens to be so one, two, three, like brokers, how long, you know, what is the diameter, you know, uh, of each of those high brokers, you know, uh, how much do they need to pump once, you know, water starts, you know, stops crashing out. So can you go to the next slide? This is a simulation of the results. So on the left side, you have what is going on now, from now, 10 months ago. Uh, what is going, what will be, you know, what the result of the implementing this new measures. Can you describe what the coloring exactly means? Yes, you know, I read all this means there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a what? I understand. What's bad in terms of words? Is it more movement? Is it more water? Is it more water? Is it what is it? It means more movement. More movement. Okay. More movement. So as you progress, the more means less movement. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We go to the next slide. Okay, so I have three more slides in our slides. Just you know, all the technicalities and we initiate discussions because you know, uh, I've seen a lot of questions how we can do that in how this is done. So just quickly here. So this is you know how this can look like. So this is the main slide. So those four holes which come in first, they will be instrumented. They will provide geometry. We will call it the the you know, it's this is how it looks like, you know, in a more detailed photo. So, you have an idea about the uh, size of the equipment, about the mess they will make, you know, they comes to make as little mess as possible. And we will need to do, a, you know, depending on the time of this board, because maybe, you know, we will have like this because we are talking about very high pressures which can uh, inject out, you know, this valve, you know. So, basically, for safety, something like this would need to be done. And can we go to the next slide? Well, sir. Yes. Can you go back to the last slide? Mm -hmm. On the bottom, it says discharge to Klondike Canyon, mm -hmm. LA CSD sewer line. So Klondike Canyon, will they be impacted with more water heading to them? Is that what that means? Mm -hmm. Or what is discharge to Klondike Canyon mean? That's a question for the MC. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. It'll, it'll be discharged, uh, potentially discharged at the point where it's under PG drive south, so it'll be piped all the way to the ocean. Uh, the other option we're looking at is actually connected with the Valley County Sanitation District sewer line for future reclaimed water use. So it will not go above the surface at all, it'll be piped entirely to the ocean. These been used in other places? <laughs> Well, this is the largest and the fastest moving. So you know, this is pretty unique. I can tell you that we did high drops of this size of the lower patient society. If so, I can just ask, let's get through the presentation and then we'll do the question and answer. Okay. okay. Then we go to the next slide. Okay, this is how it will look at the top. As I mentioned in, in, in several times, those ones at the top, which we call E group. Will be simple, will be horizontal, it will be discharged by gravity, will prevent this adhesion pressure accumulating at the time of future rains in the years to come. Again, we will collect, we will test, we will temporarily store in tanks, and then keep releasing as appropriate to cause minimal damage to, you know, to the swales and to the result. And can we go to the last slide? So I'd like to close with this one. So you know, this is you know, mitigation design. It's not something that I think it is. There's a big thing of people involved in this. People specializing you know, in geology, hydrogeology, surface water, geology control, geotechnical engineers. We closely work with the drillers because we are pushing technology to the, to the edge. 
And all of this is happening in this is why it looks like this point. It's a part, it's just emergency measures uh, about twice the size of this will be done in the future to fully you know, mitigate this brainstem issue. Uh, uh, it's all based on the medical modeling, models are calibrated, models are validated. But I also like to stress here there is a purely new process. There is an outside you know, geotechnical parameter and more which will reduce this. We are closely working with microwave cells so, you know, to uh, uh, draw the consensus that somebody doesn't miss something. 68 years of investigation, more to come. All of that will happen in a relatively short period of time. And the last Maybe I'd like to conclude to this with one more slide is that uh, as we progress, as we construct this, we will learn more and we will focus on each of these five orders is important to provide sufficient information. So thank you. Do you have more questions now? No. Thank you, Nevin. Okay, we're we're halfway through. There's your thank you water bottle so I was going to drink from it. Um, we're, we're halfway through the presentation. If you need to stand up and stretch, I'm going to hand it over to the next side of the table um, to start. But before I hand it over to Gordon Leon with the Abalone Cove Landside Abatement District, I want to kind of put the next part of the presentation this evening. Earlier, Ramsey was talking about the city council identified some assistance package and the reason is the council realized that we've got to go in and we want to be able to help the two districts in their areas and some of their mitigation measures. And so at the March 19th city council meeting, uh, the directive was to start working with the districts to identify financial assistance as well as in-kind assistance. And that's what Ramsey went over in terms of financial assistance in the, in, in the form of a loan, a no interest loan with a term of 20 years and then in-kind services where we would be working with the two districts on their mitigation measures and um, use our geologists, our geotechnical engineers, and, and some of our peer review to help the, the, with their projects. So what you're going to hear now are the, the districts and the community association talk about their projects and what and they're being reviewed by the city. So I'm going to ask Gordon Leon with the Avalon Cove Lands I believe the district to take it from here. And Anissa, if you can open up my presentation. Yeah, we'll sure. We'll turn. Yeah, we'll we'll turn on the lights. So you bring up my charts, please. Yeah. yeah. Give us a minute and your facility. Gordon, the lights. Yes, always. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not touching any of those, but I'll bring up that. Well, bring it by. I think some of the previous speakers have uh, stolen some of the material on my charts. And so some of the charts I'll go through, I'll go through very quickly and just talk and about and just talk about the items that were not. So he has city is doing that's not yeah. <laughs> Okay. So this uh my second or third chart, but our is editing. So um we were um the Avalon Code landslide is was discussed or was uh, activated in 1974. In 1980, 25 residents in Portuguese Bend got together and drilled seven wells. Those wells nearly stopped the landslide by the late 80s. Then during that time, uh, the, the Beverly Act was done. We formed the the district, and um, and currently we've got 20 operational wells, and we're pumping about 130,000 to 160,000 gallons of water every day through our drainage system directly to the ocean. 
And there's a lot of complexity and maintenance to that system. Every well has a story. They go on and off We replace the pumps on a regular basis. We drill new wells. I think we've drilled now 44 wells since that, that time. Next slide, please. So right now, it's a really interesting division of responsibilities between the Homeowners Association, ACLAD, and the, and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. When our community in Portuguese Bend was designed, the streets were the storm drains. And, um, and they're all private roads and maintained by the Homeowners Association. ACLAD really focused just on drilling wells at the time. And it was 25 homeowners that formed it. And so what they could afford was seven wells. They, um, right now, our main focus is maintaining the wells and maintaining the system and measuring the amount of water that comes out. And we uh, right now drill and replace. We used to try to drill one well every two years. And now we're up to one or two wells a year. And in the last, uh, uh, since November, we've drilled six wells. Four of them have been below uh, Porch, uh, PV Drive South. And I'm happy to say that all four wells are operational today. Now, the other thing that's important to note is that the city um, paid a chunk of money to be able to drill those four wells. But the important thing here is that Avalone Cove slide is not supported at all by this the FEMA grant that's for Portuguese fam. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Probably the primary reason is that uh, when all the, the application process was going on, um, the Avalone Cove slide was not sliding to the degree that it is today. Next slide, please. So here's what we've been doing in the in the past uh, uh, year, basically. We've drilled six new dewatering wells. Four of them are operational. We've got two left to get pumps in and electricity and drains. We've repaired the culvert under PV Drive South in cooperation with the city. Um, because we don't have a lot of money in our district, um, we had two bids for doing that repair. One was for $288,000, and I think we ended up doing it for $27,000 uh, by using a different engineering technique. But that's the kind of things that we do in our district so that we can reduce costs and give the maximum amount of service um, to the residents. Uh, we replace pumps and, uh, and fix pipe breaks on a regular basis. We've been trying to optimize, optimize the system, adding boost pumps here and there. Um, we've taken the performance of some of the wells that were pumping 11,000 gallons a day, and now they're pumping 32,000 gallons a day. And we're starting to dip our foot into the federal arena. We've just put in uh, three different applications for funds for Altamira Canyon to uh, um, partially work on the canyon. Hopefully we'll get some money out of it. Um, and then we're very involved with the city. The city has done a, a great job of taking a leadership role largely due to ARA um, in the landslide issues and pulling together um, this group of esteemed colleagues and getting us all to work together with an action item list and due dates. Next slide, please. So uh, it's already been talked about in uh, about a dozen charts, but this is what's happened to the movement in the Abalone Coast slide. And you can see that in the past two years, we've gone from what was that orange area, which was the limit of the Abalone Coast slide, and that 
red area was all called zone two, which actually had building authorized. In the past two years, that red area is now active. And so the slide limits have gone up above Vandalwood Drive. And if you want to see some, well, actually, Ken's going to show some pretty dramatic uh, pictures of, the, of some of the damage that exists there. Next slide, please. So what we are focused on primarily is um, removing groundwater. And by adding more dewatering wells, that's the only proven way that we know of to remove groundwater at this time. We would like to not have the water get into the ground, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and that's the convey the surface water to the ocean. Uh, we have a whole number of projects, I believe there's about a dozen of them, for fixing different ways in which the water gets into fissures in our local area. And then, unfortunately, then it all goes into Altamira Canyon, which is a problem. And then in our area, there are a number of places where there's large depressions, there's active fissures, and it is our intention to uh, uh, fill those fissures. Large, many of them are on private property and we'll be getting the um, working with the property owners to be able to fill the depressions and fissures. Next slide, please. So this is our big problem, Altamira Canyon. It's the largest threat to the Avalon Cove landslide stability. If uh, uh, the city has recently helped us by actually trimming back some of the foliage of the canyon. So we can walk it and see some of the figure, figures. And I encourage um, people to actually take a walk up the canyon and see the level of difficulty it will be to get the water out of the canyon. There was a study by Harrison Associates in 2016 that actually um, made a proposal to fix the, the canyon. And it was uh, uh, basically a $22 million job to put a light, uh, a, uh, pipes down the canyon to be able to capture the water before it went into the fissures. Next slide, please. So the intent, and, and we will probably come up with some variants of this, but is to remodel the bottom of the canyon such that we create an impervious surface and then cover it back up with rocks again so that it'll look just like the canyon is today. Um, and with the proposals we've put in right now, the, the three um, ones to the, um, to, the vet, uh, to Senator Butler, Senator Padilla and Representative Liu are to do the lower section between PV Drive South and the ocean. Next slide, please. Oh, we lost the chart in between this. So um, right now we do not have a funding source to be able to fix all to our game. It is a big project, which is bigger than ACLAD and maybe bigger than the city. But um, I think ACLAD is determined to work with the cities, try to find funding sources so we can solve the, the elephant in the room. So again, our ACLAD goals primarily, oh, that's not supposed to be up. Take that slide. <laughs> How did you get that one? I sent a set of charts and that was not in it. We'd all like to read your I know. <laughs> Well, and and quite frankly, you will be able to see that at the uh, the May seventh city council meeting, where we're talking about the detailed projects for for ACLAB. And so right now, we're working with our geotechnical support with the city and with the residents um, and ACLAB members to come up with a with a list. So. Um, Right now, our big 
uh, we're still focused mainly on dewatering wells, drilling more dewatering wells, plumbing them, getting them powered through Southern California Electric and drained to the ocean. Um, we're just starting to work on surface water, uh, but we're, we need to really increase our talent pool in ACLAD to be able to handle the handle surface water. And uh, and lastly, boy, really <laughs> is an old chart. Um, we're trying to have a really dedicated organization that operates wells at an economic level and is transparent to our members. Um, we do a lot of effort to um, share the finances, share what our plans are, uh, present how much water we're pumping out and what wells are failed to the extent that hopefully we're forwarding our members because we're giving them too much information. So with that, I'll get off the stage. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. It's it very interesting that the, uh, the district's three-point project is basically the sit mirrors the city's project, the Portuguese Ben Landside project, in that the district and the city are addressing the water from, from with surface water and how you deal with it with drainage swales and a natural drainage course so it doesn't recharge the groundwater, extracting water from the ground, as well as filling those fissures so that surface water doesn't enter the ground. So if we want if we can advance it two more slides, I'm gonna hand it over to almost like we coordinate. We did. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Kent, and uh, he's with the Portuguese Bank Community Association. Um, I'd, I'd like to briefly to discuss issues surrounding uh, road repairs, uh, uh, physical damage uh, to new properties and also uh, address some of the utility break issues that, that we have. So, uh, next slide. Uh, the Portuguese Bank Community Association has, has shown is a private gated community which has some implications on who has to pay for what uh, in, in terms of these repairs. 140 residents, uh, a lesser number of semi uh, uh, improved properties and, and vacant lots. The key here is that we we have access through only two roads, uh, Narcissa to the uh, to the west and Pepper Tree to the east, and it's very important that we keep these roads open, uh, not only to provide us with emergency services, but uh, uh, in case we need to evacuate in, in case of a wildfire. And uh, these roads are uh, are getting, as you would expect, because of the land movement, more and more difficult to take care of. Next slide. This is a, an example of some of the damage we're experiencing uh, in the community. The, the slide on the left is kind of a before and after. Uh, we're looking at uh, looking up uh, uh, lower cinnamon uh, from the, from Narcissa Drive. You can see the, the these expanding fissures. Uh, the uh, the road has dropped uh, more than four feet from the south to the left side. Uh, to repair that uh, with asphalt is very expensive. So what we what we decided to use is uh, what you call CMD, which is a crust uh, miscellaneous base. It's a composite material that consists uh, primarily of asphalt grindings, uh, concrete grindings, and sand. It has some, uh, some significant advantages in terms of, of cost. Uh, and when the roads are still moving, it's a lot easier to repair them with, with this material. It also has the advantage that if it's compacted properly, it won't wash away in a rain storm. So, but the other thing you need to look at, if you look uh, uh, closely, you'll see another crack forming in there. Now, this uh, this work was done less than two weeks ago, and we're already seeing that we're going to need to repair it soon. So this is the kind of, uh, of issues that we have to face. Uh, next slide. Uh, anyone that, uh, the, the one on the left, any, anyone that's driven Narcissa Drive uh, knows the kind of uh, problems we're facing. The one on the left is showing uh, uh, basically standing water uh, as as the slide moves. It, it, some parts uh, uh, rise up, some some sink down, and it forms these kinds of uh, problems. Not only standing water in the roadways, but it will divert uh, uh, water flow 
from the streets and the private properties and, and the fissures and uh, contribute to the ground, groundwork. So when we do these repairs, we have to think of both vehicular traffic and uh, and, and proper drainage. The uh, right side is a, a portion of Lower uh, Narcissa uh, above Wayfair Chapel. What I wanted to to to, to show you there is you, you're seeing a uh, one of one of the uh, equipment trucks actually grinding up the asphalt to set down the the, the CMB in its place. You'll also notice uh, in that picture a whole line of sandbags. Those those sandbags are there because water was was going over that cliff uh, down down the cliff uh, on on the way first uh, uh, property. It was uh, it was pretty important for us to, to cover that. And the the right the right then shows uh, now looking up the other, looking up the hill uh, what that 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 street looks like. Uh, uh, and and the once the, the, the CMB is a, 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 one of the big issues we're having with, with our citizens is keeping uh, large trucks off of the uh, off of the street. They either don't read or or tend to ignore uh, the no truck signs that are, that are posted everywhere. Uh, uh, as a result of that, we've been trying all kinds of things. We just passed uh, this last weekend a. Uh, uh, um, a measure to close the Narcissa gate to residents only by only allowing uh, residents own key cards or uh, uh, remote controls. The punch codes won't work anymore. Uh, as soon as we get the proper signage up, uh, that will be closed to residents only. And the benefit of that is uh, hopefully that will take uh, care of the trucks, large trucks using that street, at least going in. Uh, next slide. Um, as I said, as a private community, we have to pay for our own roads. Uh, this compares the budget on the left, uh, our annual fiscal budget uh, for uh, 12 months at 70,000 for all our road repairs. Um, the right shows our actual expenditures that we've uh, that was in, that we have incurred since uh, uh, the start of the fiscal year, and we still have almost two months to go. So you're looking at almost a four uh, fold increase. In our expenditures, so we have this is totally un, uh, totally un, unsustainable. We've uh, we've had to uh, dip heavily into our reserves. We can't keep doing that. So uh, another measure we passed, we use the uh, 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 the emergency assessment that was allowed under uh, David Sterling to uh, uh, put a, a uh, assessment on our membership. It's fairly significant to to. Uh, take care of at least the the uh, expenditures we expect uh, or projected through the next fiscal year. Uh, next slide. Okay, this uh, this this shows the different slides. The, the, the point I want to make on this slide, if you look in the lower right corner, you'll see that uh, you know the Portuguese fence slide that, that started back in uh, in the fifties. Uh, we started with one hundred and forty-seven homes, and they're only uh, 127 homes, or so there are only uh, uh, 27 on the left. Uh, if you look on the left where the Avalonia Cove is, you can see that there are uh, 129 homes that, that are threatened. Now, the land movement, uh, current land movement, and I, I just checked with the with Mike McGee's latest uh, GPS survey data, we're now moving you know, we're, uh, over uh, the Avalonia Cove area about uh, two feet per month. That's incredible. And that's probably about double what, what they were doing over the last three months of, of, uh, of uh, 2023. So this is definitely accelerating. My point is we're now, we're now in the kinds of levels, movement levels that took down most of the homes in the Portuguese town last slide. And we're worried about that happening um, here as well. Uh, next slide. Well, I've never seen that slide, but uh, okay. I, 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 I see. I guess I got to combine the uh, the up, the upper uh, upper right. It could show some uh, uh, some uh, damage to homes. Actually, it's a home on the left, and what's uh, almost completely destroyed is actually a barn. But it gives you an idea of the kinds of damage that's already occurring, and it's really related to how close you are to one of the fissures. If you're on or near a fissure, you're you're suffering a, a lot more. Uh, damage than if you're uh, if you're not. But most of the homes in the area, because we're we're all moving, we're all moving at this around two feet per month. 
uh, we're all getting some damage. Uh, uh, where I live, I'm not near a fissure, but, but I'm, I don't know if you know already, uh, uh, doors that don't open and close properly. I've had wire leaks. Uh, I've had cracks in retaining walls and uh, not looking forward to if a fissure forms up. The, the lower left is, is basically a lot, a vacant lot. And you kind of scan from uh, left to right. It's the same vacant lot. And you can see in the middle um, that large fissure uh, uh, drawing. And um, if, you, if you think about one of those, uh, you don't want one of those to, to start on your own. Next slide. Um, this is a, a, a plot of water, gas, and sewer breaks over time. And uh, this exponential increase, the, the, the vertical plot is the, the number of breaks uh, versus, versus the time below. You see this exponential increase, particularly in water, uh, pretty much tracks with the increase in land movement that we're, that we're seeing. Um, fortunately, um, cow water and uh, cow gas have been response, very responsive. I don't want to uh, seal any of uh, uh, cow water's uh, presentation, but um, these are for uh, above ground piping that we need uh, uh, in, in those areas where we're having the most damage. Um, they, the first thing we're getting for water is uh, we've identified some where we want to put some of the uh, uh, above ground swing joints over the over the, uh, fissures to reduce the number of, of leaks we're, we're getting. Because we're getting like, well, we had one this morning, but we're, uh, we've got an occasion where we've got two and even three weeks, three water leaks in, in a single day. So, all right. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, uh, Bottom line, we're really all afraid of losing our homes. Uh, you know, uh, we're watching someone else's home get destroyed or get serious damage, uh, and we're wondering how long is it, how long is it going to take for that to, to occur to us? We're facing dilemmas about if we have to we have damage, do we pay for it now? It, it, it may be that we have to redo it again in some time. So, uh, I guess the only thing uh, I can say. Is uh, I can only express what I think a lot of the membership are going to uh, express in in this uh, question and answer phase uh, that we need as much financial and uh, technical support from all levels of government, from from city to to the federal, to implement what uh, Gordon was trying to present earlier and as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I swear those slides came from the slide decks you said. You know, I didn't I didn't spend the time creating them. Anyway, I'm gonna now introduce Steve Cummins with the Klondike Landside, Klondike Canyon Landside Abatement District. Go to the next slide. Thanks, Ara. Ara gave me the wink, so that means we're uh, running late. Um uh, excuse me, I'm gonna work for my notes. I uh, I just had a 12 hour day, so uh, I jotted down a bunch of notes, and uh, hopefully, hopefully the people with uh, within the Klondike within the Klondike area listened very closely to uh, Kent and uh, Gordon that were up here because their slide has been moving for a long time, and there's some serious serious damage. Uh, there's a little bit of serious damage in Klondike, but nothing compared to uh, Portuguese Bend or uh, Abalone Cove. So they, the, the the slides are the slides are different too. Uh, we've heard about the high droggers in the uh, Portuguese Portuguese bend slide. Hopefully, hopefully you understand those are horizontal drillings. Uh, it's very difficult in both the Abalone Cove and in the Portuguese bend slide to, to drill vertical uh, vertical wells. Reason being is they get sheared off. And I think you heard that earlier. I think probably the, mo the most important thing to take away tonight is that uh, water is the enemy. Uh, keeping the water out of the ground, pumping the water that gets into the ground out, and somehow eliminating the artesian pressures at the base of the slides, very important. So that, if anything, that would be the most important thing you can take away tonight. 
that, and I think you may or may not understand it, but it's, it's very important is understanding that water is what's driving the whole thing. A little bit about um, history. We heard history before, but for the for the Klondike uh, area, for the Klondike landslide, uh, in uh, 1979, 1980, 1981, is when this uh, when this really started, and let's put the mic closer to your mouth. Oh, okay, yeah, it really started. Is that better? Are we on? Yeah. Oh, the green lights on. Green lights. Just right. hello. Yeah. Who's on? Yeah. Our city manager. Hey, you're in the weird. Yeah, but I'm a civil engineer. Oh, there this is this guy knows more about electronics. Than okay. Nothing. Lost the connection. We have another mic. No, the batteries. <laughs> Can you project? Yeah. Yeah. Battery. Battery pin. How do we get there? Okay. Um, hey, yeah. hey, yeah. You see another battery. Turn it on. There you go. IT. Extra, extra yeah, money. So in in uh, so in the early in the is it going? Yeah, I guess yeah. it is. So in the early 80s, 80, 81, uh, there there was a geologist that decided that uh, yeah, there is movement. Uh, in 82, uh, the uh, as as would had been talked about before, the Beverly Act was uh, at that time, and the uh, Klondike Canyon uh, Geological Hazard Abatement District was formed. And Perry Ely, whose name you heard earlier, actually mapped the uh, boundaries of that district at that time, which are which are still the same. Uh, that same year in 82, uh, an engineering company, uh, Seekin Engineers, was hired uh, by the city to study the land side uh, along with geologists uh, for the purpose of rec making recommendations. And I think uh, some of you have probably seen that report uh, that made recommendations very similar to what uh, our five-step plan is, is that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, in the middle of the uh, 90s, 97, uh, I believe it was a 48-inch uh, a storm drain pipe was constructed from PV Drive uh, south on the north side, under PV Drive, and all the way down to the ocean, as more or less phase one of the uh, of a plan that Secret Engineers had come up with. Uh, in '85, uh, excuse me, in '80, uh, '82, also uh, the first uh, well was drilled uh, down at the beach, and again, Perry Ely was responsible for that. Uh, I was thinking that I think I keep hitting this button. Am I still? Uh, no, I'm not. Hang on. How'd you do it before? Uh, you, you did. Okay, try it. Oh, okay. Very good. Thanks. Uh, 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 Perry Ely uh, decided that uh, there was a gathering of water down at the base of the slide, and the artesian pressure down there was, was probably significant. Uh, they drilled the well uh, uh, down there and found out it was more than significant. Uh, it's a 150 foot deep well, and they started to get about 150 gallons per minute out of the out of the well, and uh, that ran for a year or more uh, without a pump in it. And then a pump was inserted, and uh, then in 1985, a second well was drilled, and that well uh, was uh, producing. Uh, enough water where they shut down the other one that was the original artesian well. Uh, that well that was done in 85 actually is still functioning and it's pumping uh, probably around 70 to 80 gallons per minute. Uh, so that was 40 years ago. In that 40 years, uh, there really wasn't very much movement in the uh, Fondike slide. In 97, uh, we had some rains that made it move in 2005. Same thing, uh, but this recent rain, uh, the pumping records show that the the one well that was down there, uh, it varied between uh, 35 gallons a minute and about 50 gallons per minute, and held uh, held the slide back from moving pretty much uh, pretty much completely for that 40 year period. Then, 
at this time uh, in 2023, it was around uh, April, later April, May, is when all of a sudden the water table down there uh, shot up. And we knew that was uh, a, a problem. Uh, we expected with the rains in, in the winter of 23, uh, that there would be a reaction, but we didn't think it would be that significant. And, and it was, and then it continued. And then into 2024, uh, these rains that we've recently had, it seems like every weekend, uh, have, uh, have really uh, made, it, made it move a lot more. Uh, we now have, and I have a couple of couple. I have to go through a couple of pages here. I had I didn't know if people knew what um, global positioning system monuments were for survey, and I think that was pretty well covered. Um, and I had a lot of notes here on uh, what basically made the made the uh, slides move, and I think you all know that now. Uh, but I did want to talk about what what uh, was what we were doing to mitigate, and I did have one slide. I just that medium slide there for the five. Uh, yeah, it is uh, that was the five step program that we're trying to get money for to uh, to build these. It's about five point four million. Kind of goes with the five steps, I guess. Uh, step one was to uh, design and design and construct storm drain systems that go up the canyon. That was one of the original recommendations and uh, independently uh, the geologists and myself and other engineers said, yep, that's the way to do it, is to pick the water up and uh, take it down in the storm drains and get it down to where that 48 inch pipe was built. Uh, the step two, uh, also very important, it's what we're doing. And uh, we've already drilled three more wells uh, down at the beach, one deep well and two shallow wells. So we have four pumps operating at about 200 gallons uh, per minute, a little over actually. So that's very important too, to get rid of the artesian pressure at the base and to uh, relieve that uh, hydrostatic pressure that's pushing up and, and lifting the seafloor and the beach and everything else down there. So we need to get rid of that and that's step two. Step three is, is what we've talked about uh, in general of filling fissures that's uh, very much been helped by the city, thank you very much, in clearing the canyon. Uh, at one time, you couldn't even get down into the canyon because of the brush and uh, high growth, et cetera. They've actually cleared around the entry to the 48-inch pipe, uh, have cleared a path all the way up the, uh, the canyon floor, and actually beyond the canyon floor, several hundred feet. And so we plan to put pipes in there and design, engineer design the pipes such that they transport the water uh, that is catchable uh, and take it down, take it, take it down to the ocean through the 48 inch pipe. Uh, the design, the other step four is something a lot of people don't realize, and, and it's been talked about a little bit, is the ancient beach club slide. And you can see that I think in the in the uh, diagram there, and it's that blue line that I believe. I don't see it. Maybe it's not on there. But anyway, the 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 head of that slide is just to the north of uh, PV Drive South, and it forms a big crescent right above where the Portuguese Bend Beach Club is and is, is subject to sinking. Uh, you can notice that from your car, and it, it makes it such that water is actually going into the head of that slide. And there are about, uh, I think it's 34, 35 houses in the uh, beach club that are actually sitting on that, uh, on that ancient slide. It has moved a little. Uh, it's not, uh, has not moved a lot, but we need to protect that somehow and we'll build a storm drain system around that and transport the water uh, away from uh, going into the head of that slide. The uh, step five, any storm drain, and I am a civil engineer, as is our mayor, and uh, any, any storm drain system or any drainage system is kind of worthless if you don't have a good maintenance system to 
monitor and maintain it over time. And that's what step five is, is having money in the budget to be able to continue uh, to monitor, to monitor and to repair and to improve if needed. I know Gordon was saying he added extra pumps and uh, that's what we plan on doing too. We're, we're planning on putting actually three more wells uh, down at the beach and at uh, Dauntless Exultant, uh, a monitoring well, uh, because every time, 1997, 2005, uh, 2023, now in 2024, where does it always show up? It shows up right here at that intersection. And that's because that's the head of the slide and you get a pull apart area up in there and it does is devastating. If you know, people haven't been up there uh, uh, from Abalone or Portuguese Bend area, then they should go up there and look at it because it's just uh, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, what we have done, and I'll make it quick. What we have done is we one, one thing we've been uh, realizing is it is that there there's different means of, of water getting in the ground of course and it's really the rainstorms that do it and it pulls utilities apart it, it could pull a sewer apart or a water line apart or something like that that gets directly into the ground so we've been videoing storm drains and sewers to make sure they're intact the existing ones uh we've worked with the city as i mentioned to clear brush uh from the canyon floors that puts us in a position where we'll be ready to go when we get some more money from uh, agencies uh, to build those storm drains and to and, and to line the canyons as needed. Uh, the uh, drilling and installation of, of those new wells, uh, that's actually we're getting we're getting bids right now. That's going to be one of the first things we do probably within hopefully like the next couple of weeks or so to get a contract and to put uh, started at least one more deep well, 150 foot deep. Uh, working with, better put my glasses on. Working with, uh, working with the, uh, oh, we, we we continually and have been for for a number of years working monitoring uh, the uh, pumping pumping rates of the wells and also the water tables. Uh, it's very important to uh, log those. Uh, we've gone back years and looked at those. That was one thing I was commenting on was that, I mean, you look at the you look at the weekly rates on these for back in time, and uh, it's like thirty five gallons per minute up to like fifty gallons per minute, and it was stable all that time. I can't explain it, and geologists can't explain it. But now we're pumping two hundred gallons a minute. We want to pump four hundred gallons a minute. And we don't know we don't know what the ge geological difference underground is, and we don't have any good answers yet. Uh, I did mention I, I I did mention, or maybe I didn't mention the the slides are the the three slides are different. the The Klondike slide is like one large mass of of earth. And it does have the beach club side sitting on it, but it's a large, large chunk of earth. And I think I think that uh, Nevin earlier had said the complexity of the Portuguese bend flight is so totally different uh, and closer to the Abalone Cove slide, but completely different than the Klondike slide in the complexity of the slide and the number of slide elements within uh, the slide itself, uh, the Portuguese bend slide. So the 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 well system that we're talking about, the vertical well system, the 19, 1985 well that has not sheared off and is still pumping water, uh, is an example of what at Klondike space we can do that we don't or haven't had uh, issue of being sheared off. The um, we have another issue with the kind of with the Portuguese bend slide, I guess, because of the easterly side of the Portuguese bend slide rubs up against what protects us from the Portuguese bend slide, except down at the beach. And we have an issue with uh, 
of keeping dirt removal away from the two slides trying to join up. We get lateral pressures from the uh, from the Portuguese bend slide to try to hook onto the Klondike slide and accelerate it. Hasn't happened yet, but uh, we're always fearful that uh, we're going to be uh, hooking up with it and have another problem. Uh, one thing we have done is we we originally had the pumps in going into gravity systems out to the ocean, uh, but we unfortunately had the uh, the outlets of those pipes being pushed up along with the ocean floor. And so we had to switch to a force main to go all the way out to the ocean. And we, we did a manifold uh, combination of the pumps and take the force main directly to the ocean now. And um, well, we continually, we, we continually are cleaning and repairing uh, storm drains. Uh, cost mitigation and, and for the five-step plan, uh, we have a team working on that, and funding requests are uh, act actively being pursued, and I think uh, R is going to talk about that more later. And uh, we're with the city, county, state, federal associations, and uh, uh, we hope that we, uh, we we're successful with some of those. So that's all I got. Thank you. Where are you? You're on here. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, I know, Steve, thank you. There were a few other slides. We'll just skip over it. So this part of the, the presentation, we'll, we'll go through quickly so we can get to the comments and questions. It's the utility companies. I'm going to call up Angie with Cal Water, and, and I know she, she can go through this really quick in like five minutes. So. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Angie with Cal Water, and I'm actually joined here with um, two of my colleagues, Ralph Felix and Augie Plaza. Um, and we're happy to be here to provide an update on all the work that we've been doing um, with um, all of this accelerated land movement that we've um, we've seen. Um, since, sure, since, since this emergency, we've prioritized enhanced and enhanced our monitoring, um, response and planning efforts in this area. Um, and there's no doubt that this movement has been causing challenges for us, um, along with others outside of our system, but we've been committed to responding quickly and we've already taken a number of steps to address some of these challenges. Um, actually, um, We've developed new communication channels to provide a higher level of service for our RPV residents. Um, and um, one of these actually is, um, I can't even take credit for it, council member um, Seo uh, recommended it to us, but we created a dedicated hotline for RPV customers to report leaks directly to us. We also created a page on our website, um, calwater.com slash RPV where the public can can go on and, and get updates on all of the, the work that we've been doing. Um, and we're also sending out monthly community newsletter updates for those who are subscribed. And you can subscribe to those updates um, at, at our website there. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, can you go back? There was one more thing that I wanted to talk about. Back in September, you may recall that we modified our leak response procedure um, to elevate all water leaks in our PV service area to code four. And what that means is that we are immediately responding to all reports of water leaks um, immediately, regardless of the source. And to further enhance our response efforts, we have employees stationed um, in two neighborhoods, Seaside, Seaview and um, Portuguese Bend, 24 seven. And they're traveling between the two neighborhoods around the clock to be able to investigate monitor our infrastructure and respond as quickly as possible. Next slide. That's actually not true though, by the way. On the, on the system side, um, there's a lot of work that we've completed. Um, this is a map of some of the work that we've completed in the Seaview neighborhood. The red represents the above ground and blue, the blue line represents the mains that are below ground. Um, and so along Dauntless and Exultant, um, we've moved our main from below ground to above ground. And we've also um, had um, two replacements um, in two sections along Exalted Drives and Admiral, Admirable Drives. 
Next slide, please. In the Portuguese Bend Community Association neighborhood, um, we completed a similar project, moving our, our mains from below ground to above ground um, along Clove Tree, Clove Tree Lane. Um, next, next slide, please. And um, we, we also, along PV Drive South near the Wayfarers Chapel, um, added swing joints and we have replaced a small section of, uh, of our above ground main to allow for more flexibility. Next slide. We also have several projects currently underway. In Seaview, our engineering team is currently designing the replacement of, of mains um, for the Western portion of the neighborhood. <clears throat> and you can see um, the scope of the work here. Um, next slide. Um, and in Portuguese Bend, we have a very similar scope of, of work where we're looking to re replace about 9,500 feet of, of main, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and that's currently in the same um, status as the, the sea view, um, the sea view design. Next, next slide. This is also in the Portuguese Bend neighborhood. Um, along Vanderlip Drive and Vanderlip Trail, we we are looking to replace um, sections of our main by moving um, our main from below ground to above ground. Next slide. And and lastly, um, going back to Sea View, um, there's a section that's highlighted within the yellow box that our current our engineers are currently looking at um, to potentially um, move. Um, realign and, and replace. And for the Portuguese Bend Beach Club, there's a section of Maine that feeds the neighborhood that, that we're currently working with the, the neighborhood and the board to realign and, and replace. Next slide. That concludes my update and we look forward to continuing to work with, with the community. And thank you, Arna and the city for inviting us today. Thank you. Next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Selena uh, with Southern California Edison. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Selena Luna with Southern California Edison. I am also joined this evening by two of my colleagues, Jimmy Edwards and Taylor Garcia. Jimmy is our field supervisor and Taylor is our production specialist. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to go really quick through these because you guys obviously want to get to the landslide stuff. So really quickly, Southern California Edison is an Edison international company. We are one of the nation's largest utilities. We cover 50,000 square miles and have 15 million residents that we cover. Next slide, please. Um, with regards to our entire system, and especially in Rancho Palos Verdes, we have safety as our number one priority in our company. It is very important to us that not only our employees are safe, but all of our residents and our customers are safe. We know that electricity improves all of your lives, but we are also committed to safeguarding the utility and making sure everybody that utilizes it is safe. Um, we wanna remind you that if you see a down power line to please stop, stay back and call 911 immediately. If you see another public safety hazard that is not a down power line, please call 1-800-611-1911 and we'll dispatch a troubleman right away. Next slide. Um, obviously gonna go through this quickly, but you guys can all see the slides later. These are the best numbers to reach us for your various concerns. Next slide. Uh, we're also on social media in all of these venues and I'm gonna now kick it off to Taylor Garcia who's going to highlight the specific projects in the landslide area for us. <clears throat> Thanks, Taylor. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Garcia, like Selena said. I'm here representing Southern California Edison, along with Jimmy Edwards and Selena Luna. Um, I want to start off by saying, again, like she said, um, safety is our top priority. Um, obviously, with these landslides, it's a little bit more of a concern. But um, we... I'll skip down a little bit. Um, just want to let you guys know that each district has production specialists like myself and a troubleman on call 24-7 to ensure each emergency is taken care of promptly. Uh, land movement is nothing new to this area nor to Edison. We have been managing our infrastructure in the Portuguese Bend landslide since the 70s. Our crews have had to get uh, a little creative with these landslides. Uh, they have done things such as installing large springs 
on overhead conductor to keep it from pulling over the poles. Uh, we have safety measure, measures such as fault indicators and automated switches that notify the switching center immediately of a fault or, or voltage issue. For, is for issues such as leaning poles, we greatly appreciate when customers or members of the Land Conservancy reach out. Uh, pictures and poll numbers help uh, significantly with uh, minimizing the dispatch time. So far, this rapid lab mo land movement, um, sorry, let me start that over. So far, with this lap rapid land movement, both Jimmy and myself have been the uh, first contact to help mitigate the risk at hand. I'm happy to say our line crews have been able to remove Edison distribution from 40 poles out of Burma Trail and replace a handful of other leaning poles caused by this land movement. Uh, we continue to maintain our grid with technology such as automatic reclosures, branch line fusing, and covered conductor. This all helps prevent faults, especially in high fire risk areas. Uh, we hope to we hope the combined efforts with SEE and your community will continue. Uh, you guys have been a great help. You know, the residents that we've had to access the rear properties uh, to access our poles, and then along with Aura and the rest of the city, um, helping with issues that we've had. Uh, so we hope to continue these and then, um, yeah, just to mitigate any potential risk in the future. If you guys have questions, we'll answer them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Um, if, if, if you go back to the next slide, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we noticed two, two, about two years ago, around, right after the rain of 2023, the winter storms, is the power lines along uh, Burma Road were starting to lean. And we immediately reached out to Southern California Edison. And this was before we even closed that trail system. And as a result of the land movement, um, and I say this is sort of the silver lining because it's been an initiative of the city to remove all the power poles in, in the preserve. Um, we've, we've now, uh, we're in the process of removing 40 utility poles. They've been deactivated in the nature preserve and we're in the process of removing those poles permanently, the entire pole. And I know Frontier is here, Jennifer, I don't know where, where or is Cox Communication. Um, and I know you're working on, on removing the lines because um, you've got some communication lines before the entire pole is removed. So that's underway. All right, so the next speaker is Ben from Southern California Gas and I'll hand it over the mic to him. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Steinberger. <clears throat> Excuse me, I am a public affairs manager at SoCal Gas. Um, I will also try and get this through this quickly. That's not our slide. <laughs> no, it's not either. There we go. Next slide. Uh, so also uh, one of the nation's largest gas utilities, 7,800 employees, 22 million customers. Um, again, we uh, always emphasize that safety is at the core of our business. Um, in this specific area, uh, we conduct leak surveys and other inspections annually. Um, so we are out in different sectors of the area, always checking to make sure that our system is safe and reliable and continuing to provide gas service to our customers. Um, we have expedited, expedited our response timing in this area. So when you call our customer contact center and you have an issue with a gas leak, we are out there uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and we are working with our call center to keep them updated on the situation so that when you do call, they are aware of what is going on in this specific area. We go to the next slide. Um, as I just mentioned, the customer contact center, we work very closely with them. They uh, also work with our dispatch and system operators um, to get our teams out to those sites when you call, when we know when there is a leak, um, to get out there and, and address it as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a 24-7 watch desk, and that 24-7 watch desk is there to liaise with other uh, emergency preparedness agencies if in the event of something, uh, you know, we are able to uh, work with them uh, 24-7. You go to the next slide. Uh, that is my contact info. Uh, that's the phone number for our customer care center. You can press one if there's an emergency. Um, we encourage you to call them if you smell gas, um, anything like that. Um, I didn't have a slide for it, but I did want to uh, just note for this group that right now we currently have seven project sites in the PBCA area that we are working on. We are in various stages on them. Some of them are completed, some of them are in construction, and some of them are in advanced planning. Uh, we intend to be complete with those sites by, uh, I think, sometime this fall. So uh, I also will be around to answer any questions, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, I, I know you're with Supervisor Han's office. If you want to say anything, you can. If 
um, um, you could just stop me. I'm going to continue. Do you want to come up and say anything? Or... Then we can go to the next slide while Jennifer's coming out. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ara. Um, the supervisor knows that this issue is bigger than the city. It's bigger than ACLAD and KCLAD. Um, and that's why she's committed $5 million in county funds. And um, our public works department is providing pub, um, technical assistance. They've been out um, with Kent and his team. Um, and we are in contact with KCLAD and looking into additional funding opportunities for them as well. And our emergency management, Office of Emergency Management, we have Gene O'Donnell here. They, they are on the weekly calls as well. So um, we are here to support the city and the G has um, as much as possible, and um, I'll be here if you'd like to speak with me as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. So, so I'm going to wrap up the uh, and then go to the segment of tonight's town hall with the questions. But you know what you heard? I mean, all the projects. These are these projects that you've been hearing about. The city's projects, the the district's projects. They all require money. And what what Jennifer said, as the supervisor has mentioned, that this is much larger. What's happening right now is much larger than what the city can imagine. And the council recognized that and back in October, October 3rd, 2023, the city council declared a local emergency. And that was the first step in order to, uh, to secure some assistance from every branch of government. And since October 3rd, when we proclaimed a local emergency, on February 20th, the city council then um, sent a letter to Governor Newsom saying, we we are requesting that you declare a state of emergency for Rancho Palos Verdes. Our request to the governor was not a financial request. The request was specifically to relax and um, remove any of the permitting requirements, the state permitting requirements. You ask why? Well, funding is a very difficult um path or door to open when it comes to government assistance. But what we know is for our city, for our the city's project and for the district's projects, they require permitting and permitting can take years. And, and you can secure the funding, but if you don't have the permits, you can't get a shovel in the ground. And so um, we, the council authorized that letter to, to be sent to the governor. It was sent via the county through the Office of Emergency Management, was submitted to Cal OES the next day. And, and by Friday of that week, February 23rd, I, I don't forget those dates here, and they're ingrained in my head, but um, that day, uh, the Cal OES responded to the city and said, the governor said that we are covered by the state of emergency that he declared on February 4th in response to the storms. And I'm saying this because this is really important. Um, in the council's request to the mayor, it also asked that in addition to declaring a state of emergency, that a request be made to the president to declare a federal disaster. These two steps are important because they're two branches of government that come with resources. The state comes through resources, and so does the federal government. If there's a federal disaster that's declared, federal money comes to the city. Now, it depends on how it's requested. There is request for public assistance, and there's a request for individual's assistance. And this is very important. So two weeks ago, the um, we that, um, let me get my dates here. So February 23rd, we heard back from the governor a, about a month and a half later, the request was filed with um, the president to declare a federal disaster. And on April 13th, the president declared a federal disaster. So that now means public assistance and the request was for public assistance, not individual assistance. So the president declared a federal disaster for LA County among several other counties in Southern California, specific to storms that started January 31st and ended on February 9th. I believe it's the 9th or the 7th, I may have that reversed. So, but those, so those storms, what, what now happens is because the president declared a federal disaster, and what's shown up here is the city now has, we have about 30 days to compile our costs 
so that we can try to get some um, damage recovery costs. Not only does the city is the city eligible for reimbursement for the costs incurred as a result of the storms, but so are the two districts in the city. They are public agencies. Remember I said that earlier. I said that for a reason because they are eligible for reimbursement as well. So we've been working very closely with the two districts um, in compiling our estimated costs. Now we need to put in our final costs so that we can seek reimbursement through FEMA. So that that and those and typically those costs are due within 30 days after a declaration is made. So it's roughly around May 13th. That date hasn't been set firmly, but that's that's what what's being said at the moment. So you, we talked about the, the various projects that um, the city is working on, the two districts, and and like I said, funding is really important. From from a public assistance standpoint, there are different doors that are opportunities for funding to come to the city as well as the, the districts. There's the congressional district grants, and those happen every year. There's where, where our congressional leaders and representatives at the federal level will open up a grant program to fund projects. These projects could be community pool projects. They could be um, hazard mitigation projects. They, they could be any type of project. They usually fund them around a million to a million and a half. So we've been working very closely with the districts to make sure that whatever they're submitting in their projects, that it's it's at a dollar amount that um, will not automatically yield it as being ineligible because it's too high. So so they've had to try to prioritize. Um, the other thing is there's when when there's a federal disaster that's declared, there's a grant program called the Hazard Mitigation Grant that becomes available for federal funding. And this is tied to an emergency and it's to, to prevent um, emergent or disasters from happening. So the hazard mitigation is now going to be a grant program that opens up that the city's gonna explore as well as the districts to try to find funding. Again, I'm, we're just trying to find any source of revenue to help fund these projects so we can get in there and start doing some of this work. Um, the city's project, the Portuguese Ban Landside Remediation Project, and Ramsey had mentioned it was a $33 million project. We applied um, for that grant. It's the Building Resiliency Infrastructure a Community Grant. It's called the BRIC Grant. It's, it's an annual grant, unlike the hazard mitigation, which only happens when there's a disaster that's been declared. FEMA um, has as a yearly cycle of this BRIC Grant. It is a very difficult grant to apply for and to be selected for. The city attempted to apply for it in 2021. We were discouraged. We didn't in 2022. We said, let's let's do it. Um, we said, if we don't try, we'll never know. And we actually did. We submitted the application. We worked very closely with Cal OES. And uh, in August of 2023, uh, we were um, notified that we have been selected for this grant. So, so the BRIC grant is another opportunity. It's something that we'll work with the districts to see if that's an opportunity. It's a very difficult, it's a national um, competitive grant, but th the fact that the city got it and we've got the attention on this 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 landslide is, is a good sign. In terms of individual assistance. And this is really important for those of you because I'm hearing and I know I've been driving around. I see what's happening out there and I see structures that are damaged. Right now, individual assistance is not available. However, there, there may be an opportunity through the California Disaster Assistance Act, and this is at the state level, where there may be SBA loans available to, for individuals. That has not been... Um, indicated at this point so we're still we're going to wa watch and follow and i'm speaking almost daily with with la county officials so that if if that opportunity opens up we'll make sure residents know so that they can find a path forward to help individuals and in your your individual properties if you go to the next slide uh, one of the things that and, I'm, and just for the sake of time i'm not going to get into all the 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 contacts, the communications, and all the meetings that's been happening for the last six years with all the branches of our government from the federal to the state downward, but all of your representatives have been out to the land side. They, they, they started coming out in 2020, um, right at the peak of the pandemic. 
we we Senator Allen was the first um, elected to come down. It was it was late January 2020, and he toured the landslide and saw what he was seeing at the time, which is very different than what what's happening now. But he's been out there recently, as well as Assembly Member Mirasuchi has been out. Uh, Representative Lou's been out as well as uh, our other elected. And one of the things that Senator Allen wanted to do, and, and he's been, and our, our electives have been looking at different uh, funding because that's always been our request. We need money, we need money, we need money. But there was something else that he found very interesting was that the laws that are written at the state level don't identify landslides as a disaster. And 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 we chuckle, but they consider it a pre-existing condition. And when we started contacting them, they, they we were being told that this is landslides are not usually funded, they're not covered, they're not considered a disaster because they're pre-existing. And then when they find out it's the Portuguese Ben landslide that's been moving since 1956, they say, "Well, that you, you should have you you knew about that. You you know you should." Well, we're saying, look, we had it. It was stabilized. It was being managed. It's not now. This is a crisis and we need your help. And so what Senator Allen has done is he authored a bill and it's SB 1461. You all need to read it. You all need to write letters to support it because this is very important. Why is it important? Because it's going to lead to other changes at the legislative level. And so what it essentially does, it amends the Emergency Services Act. So landslides are um, a disaster that the governor can declare a state of emergency for. So this is very important. And hopefully what will end up happening as a result of this is the California Disaster Assistance Act, which is usually the money source from the state level, it gets introduced as language for the CDAA, and that opens up um, funding sources for, for landslides in the entire state of California. Next slide. So one of the reasons why we had this town hall is we were hearing, the council was hearing that uh, people don't know what's going on. They don't know what the city's been doing. We've been working on this for like six years. We've been talking about it. So all of you now know what's going on. And now what I'm going to ask you to do is subscribe to our listservs so you are actually getting all of our electronic notifications that we put out every week, sometimes every day. Uh, we need you to follow these, these listservs. Um, even if I send you letters in the mail, notifications, you're probably going to toss them in the mail. That's what happens. I know I toss the, you know, I get the letters too, and I toss them in the recycle bin as well. Subscribe to these listservs. There's a dedicated website on this. We post information on there, so you're always informed. It is in, it is our utmost um, objective is to make sure you, the residents, are aware and you know what's going on and you're engaged and everything is being done transparently. Uh, we're in this together. I say that all the time. We have to get through this crisis together. We're not pointing fingers. We're working together. So um, the last slide I have before we get to the questions is just the contact slide that we've got with, with all the phone numbers. One of the questions that came through over the last couple hours, and by the way, you have your slips. If you wanna write any of your questions, you can go ahead and write those questions. But guess what, this PowerPoint, I know you're all taking photos of these PowerPoint. It's gonna be posted on the city's website. Give us about 24 hours um, to clean it up. Um, insert some of the other slides into into the slide deck and we'll post that on the city's website so that uh, i'm going to hand it over to the mayor or the council member bradley see if they had any closing remarks and then we'll get into the um let's just go right to the right into the questions okay so so i've got i've got a handful of questions and i appreciate you um, thank you so we're gonna we're all gonna tag team. I'm gonna read through these questions. I'm gonna try to paraphrase some of the questions. Um, so I've got I've got a question here saying proactive versus reactive, um, preventive maintenance. Nineteen said where's Rolling Hills? So there've been a couple. I, I know there are a couple of questions here about rolling hills and rolling hills role in in the land side, especially as it relates to flying triangle. We are we are working closely uh, with the city of Rolling Hills. The Rolling Hills went. Oh well, oh, a lot of questions. <laughs> so Rolling Rolling Hills 
is um, part of our working group. And if you didn't know, we have a working group that meets every Wednesday at three o'clock. It's open to anybody from the public. We're gonna be here all night. Um, okay, stop writing. <laughs> So, so Rolling, Rolling Hills is 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 working with us. Um, I think what's what's interesting is okay. Rancho Rancho oh, Paula. Paula. So, obviously, we're not going to get through all these questions tonight. So, we're going to try to answer as many as we can now. But the rest of them will be on. Uh, we will respond to them, and it'll be on the website. So, apologize for that. I know things went a little bit long, but we're going to try to do what we can. But I we're see. not going to be here all night. I said three hours. I'll get you out of here by nine o'clock. I promise. Oh, that's four minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> I thought it was like eight forty. Dave Buckabell. All right. Okay. Maybe not nine o'clock. I lied. Okay. Um. So just getting to the Rolling Hills because I know that's a question that comes up. What, what one of the things that the city did as part of its landslide remediation project? It, it studied the watershed where the Portuguese Bend landslide. We have not studied the watershed for Klondike Canyon. And that's something that we are going to explore doing and perhaps working with the city of Rolling Hills to study that watershed, to really understand what's going on and have a hydrologist. So I know a lot of people are asking that question. So we'll go ahead and do that. Side too, please. Yeah, and, and so I know with Altamira Canyon and some of the, the other Kelvin Canyon and the other watersheds, they've been studied. So we're gonna continue uh, studying those as well. So Dennis asked the question, and I'm not going to read people's names, but um, the Fed and the Cal OES declaration sign off has considered including the GAD mitigation plans and the large EIA. So this is, seems like, so essentially the, the, um, the, the Feds and the Cal OES declaration sign off has the city considered including the, uh, the GADs mitigation plans. So we are, we are working with the two the two districts to try to get some some assistance financial assistance it is not part of the city's EIR i mentioned earlier on the city the city is moving forward with its project because it's in our jurisdictional boundaries it's our responsibility for, and that's why we move that project along we're close to finalizing that project and then we will um, we will then get it to FEMA and, and hopefully secure the funding for that project. And But in the meantime, we'll continue working with the districts to find funding sources, as well as the city council March 19th said they are um, they are interested in, in assisting the two districts with finance, financial assistance as well as in-kind services. So let's not forget that that's something we are working very closely with to do. Um, so we've got, is there a risk of a, a sudden catastrophe. I know this this answer because I heard uh, our city geologist answer this. So I'm going to take a stab at answering this and Mike, you can, you can steal the mic if I say it wrong, uh, wrong but no. Um, I think what's happening with our landslide, which is very different than uh, the Pear Tree Lane landslide that happened where it was a very sudden movement and it stopped. Our landslide has not stopped moving and it, it's moving at an accelerated rate, but it's not at, it's such a catastrophic rate that you're going to see a sudden collapse of, of the cliffside. So we're seeing an accelerated rate of movement, but we do not, um, the city geologist has opined that he does not expect a, a, a whole segment of the the cliff to uh, collapse into, into the, uh, the ocean. And that, when I speak of that, I'm speaking of the ancient Portuguese Ben landslide. Okay, when, when is Palos Verdes Drive um, closure is scheduled and for how long? So all of you may have heard the media is all over this and we said it at the city council meeting. As you know, I mean, I just drove down, um, I was on PV Drive South coming here from city hall and that the ski jump, I mean, my car and I drive an SUV made a big thump and I was like, oh man. Um, and, and we just repaired that road, um, that segment of the road two weeks ago, Randy, was it two weeks ago? Yeah. And, and so it's just an indication of how much that area is moving. And um, we we are continuing to do repairs to the road um, to just keep it as, as drivable as possible. We do know at a certain point, the um, the road, it's, it's dropping, it's getting so steep, you almost have to come to a full stop to drive it. We will have to regrade it, and regrading means we may have to close the road. We are hoping that doesn't happen until after school is out, and it may be 
a day or two or a long weekend, but we're going to try to do it so that, it, and we'll also try to keep one lane open if we can. We want to minimize the impact. We understand that that is a, a major arterial corridor, a corridor for the city. 15,000 trips a day use use that. It's 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 for emergency first responders use that. And I know you heard from um, the Portuguese Bank Community Association, they have two gates in and out at the Pepper Tree and Narcissa and, and the ski jump is right right in between those two areas. And so, um, and Narcissa is is in in jeopardy as well. So we, we will do our best to keep it. Two more questions. Okay. We'll please, get to the rest. please give us an update on the uh, Klondike Canyon landslide um, district's election. I'm gonna hand that over. Steve, do you wanna take that question? I Sure. Okay, hand it over to you. We had, we had a meeting a um, week ago, 11, I believe it was. Is this off again? Yeah. Did you hear it? Yeah. yeah, I believe it was the 11. And um, we had um, one of the one of the uh, the votes in by the 9th, and we had only received at the time, I believe it was uh, very few. It was like 9 or 10 22. or something. And then it moved up to 22 by the 11. And uh, so we, we decided to move it to the, our next, uh, to the 22nd, which was our, uh, which was our, our regular board meeting. And so it's uh, moving forward to that. We have three candidates, two seats. And uh, I think at this point, that's all I know. I'll, I would have to uh, uh, see if anything is coming to do. I, 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 Heard this morning that we have now 46 ballots uh, back. So uh, we're moving in the right direction. So I assume that when we get the over uh, half of, we have 107 uh, homes, units in, in the district. So I'm assuming that when we get over 50%, we'll proceed with the town and uh, get, get those two seats out. Steve. And by the way, if you didn't know that the city owns property in both districts and we pay into those assessments and we're voting members uh, as part of the districts as well. So we do pay into that. And we, I think we, uh, the city pays a significant amount and yeah. probably the, the lion's share of for both districts because we own most land in both of the districts. So last question. And, uh, and as council member Bradley said, what we'll do is we'll take all of the written comments and we'll create a matrix and we'll respond to it and we'll post it on the city's website. So at least you know that your comment was, was responded to. So this last question is, with the alarming land movement in Seaview with the city, will the city deny permits for large new construction projects near the K-Clad border and near recent waterline breaks? So I know there's a development application in the Seaview neighborhood. I'm getting copied on all those emails. It When the council declared a state of emergency. They put a moratorium on all construction within the boundary limits of the the lands, the ancient landslide complex. This project is outside, but it is in very close proximity to it. It does need to go through all the permitting processes, including a geologic review, in order to to see if it can move forward. I we're not saying one thing or another. It's got to go through the process because it is not within the boundary limits of the moratorium. So we do need to go through the process and see what the outcome is through the development process. Okay, I'm going to hand the microphone to the mayor, and I believe it's on exalted. Admirable. Is it admirable? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a time frame when those questions might be answered? It will probably be in a week or two. We um, there's a lot going on, so we'll 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 start to work on those questions. But the PowerPoint will be posted within the next 24 hours. Some some of the questions are very complex. Some of the questions are very complex and are going to take a little while to come up with the answers. Uh, some of them probably have no answers that the city can actually provide, uh, but uh, we will do the best we can to get you all the information that the city has. Uh, and I know city staff will start working on that uh, tomorrow. So we will try to get the get it all posted as soon as possible. 
All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for sitting through all that. That was a lot of information to take in. I want to thank everyone that came on the pan both panels uh, for being here. Um, we're going to make sure that all your questions get answered. Um, and so thank you all. And just for more formalities from the city council, we need to adjourn this meeting to tomorrow, April 18th, budget workshop at Hess Park at 6 p.m. So three nights in a row for the city council. And have a good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming. I told you the answer. I just no answer. I'm talking about That was our hologram. That was our hologram. When did you get your money for that?